What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet. We're living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time. I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. If you're currently listening to us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, welcome in. As always, please make sure you leave us a detailed review, any five star rating. What's up, everybody? And welcome in to episode 153 of the sit down. I am your host, Jeff Nadu. As always, we are presented. By Provada Cigar Club. Check out our signature sit down cigar available now. The link to buy is in the descriptions of this video and audio. Let's get back to it, folks. Without further ado, we don't like to go through a lot of preambles here on the show. Another week, another sit down. Spring is here. I hope everyone had a very good Easter. I hope everybody is enjoying the somewhat nicer weather. It's getting a little bit warmer, getting a little bit nicer out. So hopefully you are enjoying your spring. This week, we've got a great episode planned for you today. We've seen the evolution of mob YouTube over the last couple of years. We've seen guys coming out of the shadows to talk about their life story. And most recently, he did it sparingly and not much. But there's a new guy in town and his name is very famous. The son of Greg Scarpa, Greg Scarpa Jr., recently made his presence felt on YouTube doing two different interviews. We learned a little bit about the life of Gregory Scarpa Jr. and what it was like living in the shadows of his demented and very powerful father. Today, though, we're going to delve a little deeper. The story of Gregory Scarpa Jr. Next. On the sit down, Greg Scarpa Jr. was born in 1951 and he grew up for some part of his early life in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, as we know, with Greg Scarpa Jr., his father is Colombo Capo and mob informant Gregory Scarpa Sr. Now, Greg Scarpa's mother was a woman called Connie Forrest. That was Greg Scarpa Sr.'s first wife. Now, as we know, Greg had a very, uh, uh, you know, popular kind of courtship with a young woman, Linda Scarpa, um, and he would ultimately have kids with her as well. So Greg Scarpa Jr. had a uh, kid or brothers and sisters with his mother and then his stepmother, essentially. Uh, now, for Greg Scarpa Jr., he would say that he would live up until about third grade in Brooklyn, and then the family would move to Staten Island. Greg Scarpa Jr. would mention that most of his former years were at this home at 43 Marsker Place in Staten Island, New York, in the uh, Prince's Bay section, I believe, of um, Staten Island, uh, way down on the, uh, you know, essentially not far from New Jersey, quite honestly. Um, not mo most Staten Island is not far from New Jersey, but uh, the south end of, of Staten Island. Uh, Greg Scarpa Jr. would say that, you know, he really didn't know much about what his father did really until he was in school and he would see things on the news and his sister would actually mention the word mafia to him. And he would actually talk about the fact that when he was a kid, you know, he would get in trouble. He would have fights with kids. And he mentioned one story on a recent interview that basically he got into a fight with a kid. It was broken up. And he went home and his father told him that if you come home tomorrow and that kid's not severely beaten, uh, you're going to have a problem. So he was taught the fight at a young age. And I think it was pretty clear that Greg Scarpa Sr. raised his kids to defend themselves. Right. And look, I think eventually they found out who their father was. Greg Scarpa would say that in and around 1965, he would actually be kicked out of school. And that's where his dad decided to tell him that. He was going to take him to work in Brooklyn. And this is where Greg Scarpa Jr. would start meeting all sorts of very powerful mobsters, including Joe Colombo, who he said he really liked and liked being around. Now, remember, at that time in the early to mid 60s, Gregory Scarpa is a made member of the mafia, but he is not 
a high ranking member. He's just a soldier. He's in the crew and actually reports directly in the 60s. Joe Colombo had people that reported directly to him, including Gregory Scarpa, as well as Greg Scarpa's mentor, Charlie uh, Lo Cicero, and also Joe Iacovelli, among others. All of these people directly reported to Joseph Colombo uh, Sr., who was very high ranking at that time. Now, for Greg Scarpa Jr., he would first try to kind of get into criminality in his late teens and into his early 20s, in and around the early 70s. It was said that Greg Scarpa Jr. was involved most of his life in the mafia selling drugs, including large amounts of marijuana. It was also said that he engaged in robberies, bookmaking, and burglary. So for, for Greg Scarpa, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And as I say, time and time and time again on this show, most of these people, right, the sons of these people, their lives are already decided for them. How many people have father, followed their father into the life? Greg Scarpa wasn't just a guy who whacked one or two people. Greg Scarpa whacked dozens of people, and he was a very high-ranking member in the Colombo crime family. As we know, though, he was also a mob informant, which we'll talk about just a little bit towards the end of this show. But this show is about Greg Jr. Now, according to Greg Jr., he would, in his own words, be made in and around 1977. However, and I'm not saying he's lying. I'm not saying anything like that. There are historical records, though, that back up the fact that he was made probably around 1981. Who are we to say that he wasn't? Um, I haven't looked deep enough into it to know. Like, it wasn't like a Michael Frenzy situation, though. Greg Scarpa claims that he was made with Michael Frenzy. So we've also heard Michael has had questions on when his ceremony was. Um We'll just say that Greg Scarpa was made either in the late 70s or early 80s. There is historical record, including LCN bios, which generally report on making ceremonies. They make it clear that Greg Scarpa was made in 1981. And now he was made in the, the mafia in the same ceremony as another son of a mobster, Joseph D. Domenico Jr. Now, as we know, we did a show on Joe D. Domenico Sr., a.k.a. Joe Delmonico, who was a high-ranking member in the Gambino crime family. He followed his father into the life, too, but went with the Colombo crime family. And D. Domenico is important due to the fact that he has run-ins down the road with the Greg Scarpa crew. He was with the Greg Scarpa crew. Now, upon becoming a made member of the mob, Greg starts hanging around his father. Now, at this point, Greg is in the crew of Charlie Moose Panarella, which Greg Jr. would be placed into that crew as well. We've done a show on Charlie Moose. You can see it here. Uh, Panarella is a guy who, look, Greg Scarpa was a mean dude, but Greg Scarpa actually referred to Panarella as, quote, mean. And Panarella was a lunatic. Um, he was kind of the lunatic in the Colombo family before Scarpa. There's always been a lot of lunatics in the Colombos. They were definitely probably one of the more ruthless mafia families. Uh, they had several just very powerful and sadistic individuals. Now, this, I just want to kind of talk about Panarella. Panarella had a really, really powerful crew. I mean, Jackie DeRoss, Bill Catolo, Greg Scarpa, very powerful people that ultimately became higher ranking uh, down the road. It was said about Panarella at one point in the 90s, when Panarella was in, I believe, his late 70s, early 80s, that he would still, you know, put the fear of God into people. Um, Panarella was a tough dude. And look, Greg Scarpa Sr. obviously knew what it was going to be to be a tough guy, but being around people like Panarella and then Jr. being around Panarella, it was no secret that they weren't going to be very lethal individuals. And Scarpa Jr. was following in the footsteps of his dad pretty quickly. Now, I want to fast forward to the early 80s. One of the things that Gregory Scarpa was engaged in was bank robberies and burglaries. And at one point in 1980, Greg gets into some sort of robbery with a crew uh, that had multiple members of the Colombo crime family, including Carmine Sessa, and a man called Dominic Soma. Now, Soma 
is an interesting name. He actually at one point was very close with Mimi Cialo, who was whacked uh, at one point. We talked about him. It was said that he disrespected Carlo Gambino. Soma was a powerful guy in Brooklyn. He was doing bank robberies. So Scarpa Jr., Sessa, and Soma set up on a bank in Queens. Uh, they decided to pull off a robbery. Um, now, during the robbery, Soma is on lookout with Greg Jr., now, Soma would then complain to his crew leader, a person called Scappy Scarpati, that Greg Scarpa Jr. had allowed a security guard to walk in on the robbery team. Now, according to Carmine Sessa, who down the road became a rat, he would say that when Greg Scarpa Sr. learned of the criticism made toward his son, he asked to have Dom Soma killed. So, again, just rumors Scarpa hears that Junior's being talked about, that he, you know, dropped the the you know the ball in this whole robbery, and that you know, he's probably the reason we were almost getting caught. Da 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 da. Scarpa Senior doesn't take well to that, and he asked for the contract to kill Dom Soma. So so Greg Scarpa is very upset. Now on August twentieth, Soma's presence was quote requested at the Wimpy Boy Social Club, which was Greg's uh, headquarters. Uh, in and around that time. Upon entering the club's back room, Dom Soma was properly whacked in the back of the head by Scarpa himself. Now, other members in the room present included Carmine Sessa, Joe DiDomenico, and Gus Ferracci. Now, the body was rolled up and dumped in a landfill in Staten Island. Now, down the road six days later, Greg Scarpa Sr. reported to his FBI handler, a person called Lynn DeVecchio, that Soma was whacked for planning an unspecified private move not sanctioned by leadership. It was neither the first nor the last time we know he would commit murders as an FBI informant. So again, we have to ask ourselves, why did Lindley DeVecchio allow Gregory Scarpa to continue to whack people as an FBI informant, because as we know, that is a no-no. Um, but we all know he did also lie, and he kind of like shifted it off that, oh, yeah, he, that guy was whacked, but we didn't do it, and he just did something he wasn't supposed to. When in turn, the reason Dominic Soma was taken out was because he disrespected Scarpa Jr. That's just the truth. Now, I want to go over some of the things that, according to the federal government, they believe that – Gregory Scarpa Jr. was doing as far as putting work in. Now this, again, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we will learn down the road that Gregory Scarpa put all these hit jobs on his father and said that it was him that did it, uh, which is kind of a weak move in his own right. But I want to go over them because they are all high profile. Many people don't know this. Uh, Greg Jr. was a hitter as well, and he did a lot of things. And then I want to get into Gregory Scarpa's marijuana business, which is really his undoing in the end. I want to talk first, one of the crimes that uh, Mr. Scarpa allegedly did um, was in July of 1981. He is allegedly involved in uh, taking out Colombo mobster Robert D. Leonardo. And no, that is not Mikey Scars. That is Mikey Scars' brother, Robert D. Leonardo. Um, now, Mikey Scars has talked a little bit about this, but not too much. And we will obviously, you know, like to hear down the road when he does comment on this. From what I understand through my research is Gregory Scarpa and Robert D. Leonardo, who was affiliated with the Scarpa crew, got into some sort of drug deal and it went bad, and Robert D. Leonardo was whacked. Um, we haven't really heard much in the way of what exactly happened here. Now, my whole thing is, I, and I wonder this, it was common knowledge that D. Leonardo, Robert, was involved with the drug trade. Gregory Scarpa was involved in extorting drug dealers, robbing drug dealers. Maybe signals crossed there and something went on here, and Scarpa and the crew realized that Robert needed to be taken out. Though, if you look into what Michael has said about this, he has said it's common knowledge that he wanted to, to, to take retribution for this, but that he was talked down by the administration of the Gambino crime family and told to leave it alone. Um, so, again, kind of an unknown thing that we don't really remember happened. 
But, you know, obviously, look, Mikey D. Leonardo, Robert D. Leonardo, long lineage of mobsters too. Um, but these groups cross, right? And some families are in one family, some are in the other, and it becomes very distorted. Um, now, again, as I said, Greg Scarpa has claimed with all of these that it wasn't him that pulled the trigger. It was his either his father or someone else. Another uh, thing that happened during all this was, and this is a sad one, in 1984, uh, it was said that Greg Scarpa Jr. was allegedly involved uh, in taking out a woman called Mary Berry. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into this. According to Carmine Sessa, who down the road would flip, he would say that in and around 1993 or in the early 90s, Mary Berry was dating Alphonse Persco, Little Alley Boy. Little Alley Boy got caught up in an indictment and went on the run. And Mary Berry, who was kind of a person who liked wise guys, she was kind of a, a girl from the neighborhood, it was said she knew where Alley Boy was. So Greg Scarpa moved to get rid of her. Now, Sessa claims that she knew where he was hiding, so that was that. She would say that the woman was lured to the Wimpy Boy Social Club on thought that she was going to get a job there. She was kind of a cocktail waitress, very good-looking woman. You know, it was said she she showed up in like a snakeskin, you know, get up. She had boots on, she looked really good. Uh, and they lured her there and took her out. Now, Sessa would claim that she arrived looking, you know, the part. But instead of walking in, she was immediately grabbed by Greg Scarpa Jr., shoved to the floor, and Scarpa himself whacked her three times. Um, and look, I think they'll claim that they were worried. But remember, guys, okay, and I, I think this is important to say, when you folks want to talk about how great these people are and they're legends, think about what you're saying. OK, these are people that have no problem grabbing a woman by the throat, throwing her to the ground and executing her. Here's the thing. You have to look at someone like Mary Berry and be kind of sad, surely sad for her. this is a girl who, you know, is from Brooklyn. She dated wise guys. Right. That happens. You know, women like bad boys. I don't think she asked. She, she just maybe knew a little bit too much. Remember, these have, these people have no problem executing a, a young woman with no care in the world. So when we want to call them legends, like, remember that. One of the also things that Greg Scarpa Jr. was allegedly involved in was uh, the whacking, as I said, of, in 1987, Joe D. Domenico, who was part of the Scarpa crew and was the son of of mobster in the Gambino crime family, Joe Delmonico. Now, I've talked about the name change. Uh, Joe uh, changed his name, and his son, who he was kind of estranged with, was part of the Colombo crew, made guy, and they had kind of a falling out, didn't talk for a while. Um, but in 1977, according to what we know, Brewster Jr., which is what he was called, um, was – whacked and it could have been for various amount of reasons but most people believe that greg scarpa had some sort of paranoia that supposedly d domenico had found god and decided to go straight and lead the life and scarpa feared that joe brewster jr was possibly going to flip so in his stupor and paranoia decides to take out d domenico so again, we're hearing various times where junior and senior are both carrying out hits on behalf of their own interests or paranoia or whatever. So like father, like son, as they say. Now I want to talk a little bit about Gregory Scarpa and his um, very lucrative uh, weed business. Now the government contends that between the mid to late 80s, Gregory Scarpa Jr. had something called the Scarpa Crew, which is in parts of Bensonhurst and then into Staten Island, where they actually used and threatened violence to drug dealers to force them to pay a tax, as well as running marijuana concessions on Staten Island. Now, the business would involve 
also assaults, bribery of cops, et cetera. And the government is trying to build a case that not only are they engaging in distributing weed, but they're also shaking down drug dealers, they're assaulting drug dealers, they're whacking drug dealers, uh, and they're forcing them by extortionate means to pay a street tax to operate. And this is where when we look back to like the Robert D. Leonardo hit, this is where it gets a little fuzzy, right? But all of Scarpa's people, Scarpa Sr., whether it was his son, Gus Faraci, Joe Domenico, D. Leonardo, all these guys, they're all in the streets putting in work, making money, doing what they have to do to survive. And it's all flowing up to Scarpa and then up in turn to the high ranks of the Colombo crime family. Eventually, though, for Greg Scarpa, the problem is the federal government is starting to close in on him. And you look at all of his people as well, people like Kevin Granado, uh, Mario Parla Greca, all these guys down the road, the feds would bring a very large racketeering indictment too. Now, this is where it gets interesting because in and around uh, 1987, November of 1987, a large indictment comes down on members of the Colombo crime family, including Greg Scarpa Jr. Now, down the road, the feds contend that Lindley Del Vecchio, Greg Scarpa's handler, allegedly warned Scarpa Jr. because for whatever reason, Greg Scarpa is nowhere to be found when it's time to pick these guys up on this case. And Greg Scarpa would go on the run for over a year. In fact, at one point, he would be featured on America's Most Wanted. Eventually, though, on August 29th, 1988, Gregory Scarpa Jr. is tracked by the DEA to a hotel in Lakewood, New Jersey. After a large standoff, Greg Scarpa Jr. is taken into custody. He would be hit with RICO, drugs, etc. And in February 27, 1989, Greg Scarpa would be convicted and sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. So by this point, we're talking about late 80s, early 90s. Not only is Greg Scarpa Jr. going away, but his father at this point has now contracted HIV, AIDS. Um, he is, you know, got got a, you know, death sentence because of the disease. Um, and Greg Jr. is going to go away. Uh, I keep saying, like father, like son. Um, this was the fate for these guys. And, you know, Greg, at that point in 1989, is in his... 40s, Greg Jr., uh, and he has to realize that he'll be his father's age or a little younger when he gets out of prison. So Greg Scarpa heads off to prison, um, and I want to talk a little bit about – he has told a story recently in a recent interview he did with a person called Bill Courtney, who was a cop. Greg Jr. discusses that in prison, he gets into a physical altercation with – Vic Amuso, and he talks about leaving him bloody and beaten. And this is where Greg is sent to ADX. And due to the fact that, again, during his time in prison, the feds come down on Greg Scarpa again in the mid 90s with another indictment alleging uh, Rico as well, but murder in aid of racketeering. And they contend that all of these murders that we talked about earlier, Greg did, and they were going to try to put him away for life by a superseding indictment. Coupling that with the fact that he beat up Vic Amuso, they send him to ADX. Now, again, when we hear mobsters tell stories like this, right, beating up Vic Amuso, we're taking his word for it. I have no reason to believe he's lying. Now, you're probably asking, why did Greg Jr. beat up Victor Amuso? According to what we know, Vic Amuso was going around talking about his rat father, essentially, to which Scarpa Jr. took a, you know, an issue with that. That's his dad. And he essentially says to Amuso, what about Caso? That was your boy. That was your best friend. You know, maybe, you know, kind of connected it. And that was a good comeback by Scarpa Jr. They fight in a cell. You know. Shit happens, coupling with the indictment, the re-indictment, the Federal Bureau of Prisons can't deal with Scarpa, so they sent him to ADX. And here he can be seen inside the ADX. 
And we know that's the ADX because the ADX is one of the only prisons in the federal system that have timed showers, which we can see in the background. Now, for Greg Scarp, I want to first talk about his indictment and his re-indictment. He, down the road, would say that most of, in fact, all the murders they were trying to pin on him, his father did, not him. He would then also testify in the Linda Vecchio case as the government brought murder charges on Linda Vecchio, claiming that he was complicit and helped Gregory Scarpa Sr. Uh, whack certain people. Um, but Greg would be convicted in 1999 in the new case and be given 40 years. Now, his eligibility date for release was initially in 2035. Now, at one point during the trial, Greg Scarper was housed at the old MCC in Manhattan. And this is where Greg Scarpa's assistance to the U.S. government um, down the road would very much pay off for him. During his time in MCC, he was housed on the same floor as World Trade Center terrorist Ramsey Youssef. Now, I'm going to read the 302 that Gregory Scarpa gave to the feds in 1996. Now, Scarpa advised that Ramsey Youssef began slipping papers to him, half sheets of paper rolled up with writing on them. Now, according to Scarpa, Youssef writes in sentences and that he advised that when Youssef slips in these paper, that he write on the paper that he wants them back. Scarpa advised that he only kept the notes for a matter of minutes. Now, I want to get into what Ramsey Youssef absolutely said or what Greg Scarpa says that Ramsey Youssef said to him. Scarpa advised that there was a guard permanently assigned to both Ishmael, who's another terrorist, and Youssef. And sometimes they check the newspapers before they're given to Youssef, and sometimes they don't. According to Scarpa, Youssef told him, if you're interested, I'll teach you things nobody knows. Youssef would also tell Scarpa, quote, I'll teach you how to blow up airplanes and how to make bombs and you can get the information to your people, meaning Scarpa on the outside. Yusef told Scarpa, I can show you how to get a B-O-M-B on an airplane through a metal detector. Yusef would also tell Scarpa that he would totally teach him how to make timing devices. Now, according to Scarpa, he would also say that Yusef, quote, wants to hurt the U.S. government and wants to teach Scarpa how to also. Scarpa would advise Yusef that he had not asked for any specific help, but that Yusef wanted to blank things up, but he did not say why. Yusef would also tell Scarpa that during the trial, they had a plan to, quote, bang up a plane to show how serious that they were and to make their demands. So in this whole thing, Scarpa contends that they never specifically said what plane they were going to do that to, etc. Now, Scarpa also contends that Yusef gave him information on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was originally going to be a September 11th hijacker, but he didn't end up being one, but he was also a terrorist. So remember, the government, at least from the federal standpoint, instead of saying thank you for this information, certain people in the Fed said he's lying, he's making it up. To which when Greg was at the ADX, they sent a polygraph expert out to um, the ADX to talk to Scarpa and to give him the polygraph test, to which they claimed he failed. Now, down the road, while at ADX, Greg Scarpa also starts communicating with Terry Nichols. Now, as we know, Terry Nichols was involved in the planning and um, planting of the Oklahoma City uh, bomb that killed 168 people in Oklahoma City in 1995. Now, Greg Scarpa complained, con contends that Nichols was warning that a cache of nitrogen methane was buried at his old home in Harrington, Kansas, and that it should be retrieved and that it would be used to mark the 10th anniversary in 2005. According to Nichols as well, the explosives were buried with ammunition under a pile of rocks in a crawl space between and beneath the house where the FBI had supposedly done a thorough search 10 years earlier. Now, eventually, when he got word from Nichols, 
Scarpa Jr. contacted a forensic investigator called Angela Comente, who had been working to get him a lawyer the past couple of years. Now, the most significant revelation from Scarpa Jr., according to Clemente, was that Nichols' alleged admission that others unknown were involved in the Mura building plot, despite Timothy McVeigh's insistence that he was the only one alongside Nichols and that they had acted alone. As well as another allegation Scarpa learned from Nichols was that Roger Moore, who was an Arkansas gun dealer, whose girlfriend testified against Nichols and McVeigh, may have been an FBI informant, and that Nichols alleged it was Moore who supplied the tubes of the high explosive that were buried in the crawl space. So down the road on March 4th, 2005, again, polygraph expert is sent, and they insist that he fails. Now, Clemente would try to state, and she would state in a you know, well orchestrated memo that you know polygraphs are not you know perfectly credible, and that Nichols, um, this guy's giving you information that uh, is incapable. Now, just as he had with Yusef in 1996, Scarpa offered the FBI details of the explosives and the location that only Terry Nichols himself could have known. Clemente and Dr. Dresch reduced Scarpa's verbatim recitation of Nichols' account to a memo and sent it to a U.S. congressman. Now, in that, they predicted that if the FBI searched the crawl space, they would indeed find very much things that only Scarpa and Nichols could have known and that Nichols only would have known, which included a cardboard box approximately 18 by 18 by 18, wrapped securely in clear plastic wrap containing a full case of the nitromethane red tainted liquid portion and two part binary explosive components known as kind stick. So Scarpa had information that only Terry Nichols could have known. And even in fact, the FBI couldn't find when they did a search on Terry Nichols property. So the government contends that all of this information was false and not true. And it was just his word for it. And he was making it up. However, Greg Scarpa outsmarted them because he actually was told this stuff. Uh, and down the road in 2016, Gregory Scarpa's help for the federal government was given and he was reduced as far as his prison sentence from 40 years to 10 years. Now, during his time in prison, Gregory Scarpa was diagnosed with cancer and started to have many health problems. In 2020, Gregory Scarpa Jr. was released from federal prison. He is currently 72 years old. Now we will hear a certain segment of the community on here called Gregory Scarpa a rat. We'll let you decide. What do you think? Greg Scarpa may have saved dozens, hundreds of people in not one, but two situations involving either homegrown or international terrorists. We ask you this. Let's say you are in Greg Scarpa's position and you start getting kites from Ramsey Youssef. You got to tell someone. These people on here are nuts, some of them. They'll tell you, he's a rat. Who cares? In fact, he's a hero. For, for this and what he did, Greg Scarpa Jr. is a hero. And we thank him for what he did. Now, the elephant in the room and what people will ask me is, why can't you get Greg on the show? Um, well, I tried. Um, you know, Greg is, you know, like some people, look, and this is no issue. Greg has the information that a lot of us want. Uh, Greg asked for a certain amount of money. I don't generally pay guests. I hope down the road, maybe sometime I could speak to Greg. Um, he seems like a wealth of info, and I think it would be dope to interview him due to the fact that, you know, a lot of us have a lot of really intimate details, and we could, I think, have a really good conversation. That said, I think anything we can get from Greg Scarpa is a benefit and very interesting nonetheless. Um, so if you haven't, go check out Greg Scarpa's interviews on some of the channels that are out there. They're pretty easy to find. Um, but I think it's a fate that I think was pretty much decided for Greg Jr. pretty quickly. Um, do I think he whacked some of the people that they contended that he whacked? Probably. Um, we're never going to get him to talk about them. 
um, because he contends that he didn't do them. Um, do I think he was there? Surely, surely, for at least one of them, absolutely. And we have to remember one of them was of a woman. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but I think we'll see more of Greg, and, and I think that will be great. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the episode today. Uh, another week, another sit down. As always, make sure you leave us a comment, what you think of the show, what do you think of Greg Scarpa. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. We got a pretty good interview, I'm thinking, next week. I'm, I'm kind of getting the particulars on it, but uh, it'll be a person that, that very few people have talked to. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, thank you for watching, for listening, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.